<coughs> Let us uh, carry on where we left off yesterday. I think there was one uh, uh, question left. Uh, and uh, so here we go. Let's see what we have here. Dear Ajahn, when I first became interested in Buddhism, uh, I was very keen to ordain as a bhikkhu. However, I had two elderly parents uh, uh, in bad health uh, who were also poor. My only sibling uh, lived abroad, uh, far away, so I have had to live as a lay person for over 20 years now. When friends ask me what is the advantage of becoming a monk, I say to them, uh, imagine you are driving to London, uh, the fastest, most convenient way to drive there is on the motorway. That is a special road with its own rules. Uh, so being a monk is like going to Nibbana using the motorway. Uh, <laughs> Lay practice is like trying to drive to London using the normal road system. It takes longer and is more hassle, but it is possible, except the last mile when we have to go a bit on the motorway. All right, so a little bit of motorway, that's good now. <laughs> those people that ordained late in life, is that right? They're going to take the motorway towards the end, maybe, I don't know. As lay people, we have to contend with roundabouts, okay, traffic lights, etc., etc. The trick, I think, is to pick the better A roads and not get lost on too many country lanes. So, thank you for all your wise teachings. Okay, so I guess that is, uh, is good. So don't get stuck on the country lanes. The country lanes in England are very narrow, aren't they? They're very, very, very charming, yeah, but it takes a long time to get, get somewhere. So that's, a, that's a good point. Uh, so uh, there's a certain, yeah, anyway. Okay, good. Uh, thank you for that, uh, for, uh, that uh, insight into how you look at those things. I think that is uh, kind of the, quite right. It's a bit like the, uh, the way the Buddha speaks about the monastic life. The idea, of course, to lay down the monastic life is uh, precisely because it is uh, considered a slightly faster and more efficient uh, route to the end of the path. That's quite right. Uh, all right, let's carry on to the next one. Dear Ajahn, thank you for your wise teachings and wholesome presence. I have read in the Udana, the Sutra or something, about the Buddha uh, giving a graduated teaching uh, which runs generosity, virtue, heaven, drawbacks to sensuality, reward, rewards of renunciation. Uh, and this is when the listener mind was. Uh, uh, malleable, clear, free of hindrances, what I would teach to four noble truths. So, is, there, is this a good roadmap for practice uh, if we are right at the start? Thank you. I think this is a good roadmap, uh, and it's a very interesting one. It's one that occurs in a large number of places, uh, especially when people end up becoming stream enters as a result of the Buddha's teaching. Uh, he actually teaches in this sequence, uh, and then at the very end they are often reach some kind of stage of awakening, actually. Yeah. There is another graduated training, which uh, is probably more the one that uh, I would recommend you to follow, because it is more detailed, uh, and that is a gradual training, which uh, starts off discussing virtue in a lot, lot of detail. You get much more details uh, in this particular version. Uh, it discusses what it means to have right speech, what it means to have right action, uh, then it goes on to uh, some minor details of virtue, and then it goes on sometimes on to contentment, uh, how to be content is a beautiful passage about that. Uh, then there is the uh, uh, sense restraint formula, uh, and then you have the uh, uh, clear comprehension, mindfulness and clear comprehension, then you have the abandoning of the hindrances, uh, and all of, everything is described in great detail, so it's quite interesting. Uh, then you have the four jhanas, and then you have the three higher knowledges. Uh, and that particular presentation is found in a large number of suttas, and one of the most uh, in, um, famous ones uh, is found in the middle-length sayings of the Buddha, uh, number 27, uh, which is called the shorter, uh, the shorter sutta on the simile of the elephant's footprint, uh, the Chula Hatti Padopama Sutta in Pali. Uh. It's very famous because this was a sutta that was taught in Sri Lanka when uh, Venerable Mahinda, Mahinda was... Uh, King Ashoka's son, yeah, King Ashoka was the greatest emperor in Indian history, he was a Buddhist, uh, and he would send his children abroad to convert other countries. Uh, that's kind of cute, isn't it? Uh, send your children, okay, son, you convert Sri Lanka, 
Don't do, okay, you also go to Sri Lanka, Sangamita also went to Sri Lanka, and, uh, and he kind of sent his children around the world to kind of spread Buddhism. Uh, it's kind of nice. He was really dedicated Buddhist, this King Ashoka. Uh, actually, I think his children, they voluntarily became monastics. It wasn't as if they were pushed by their, their dad, but anyway, so... Uh, and of course, when Mahinda went to Sri Lanka, he landed in Mahintale. Mahintale is a, a place in the north of Sri Lanka, close to Anuradhapura, which is one of the ancient capitals. Uh, and we can go there today, it's kind of high ground. Uh, and he's supposed to come through the air, yeah, like uh, there, were, there weren't planes in those days, so you had to come through your own power through the air. Bang! Landing on Mahintale. Talam is like dry ground. Uh, and Mahintala is like the name of uh, Mahinda, so the, the dry, I think that's what it is, uh, Mahinda's uh, dry ground or something like that. Uh. And so, and then uh, the sutta that he taught the king and the king's entourage and the court uh, was this particular sutta. And so this is very famous in kind of Sri Lankan history for that reason. Uh. And it's the uh, shorter sutta on the elephant's footprint, Majin Manikai 27. And that has that full um, gradual training. It's very beautifully presented there. Really, really inspiring and nice. And I should really read that sutta out on every retreat. Uh, unfortunately, I don't. There's too many suttas to read out uh, on every single retreat. Uh, still, uh, it would have been nice. But So that is the one I really recommend you to take as your kind of main guideline, because it has much more details. Uh, but this one too is actually very interesting. Yeah although it is not expressed in as much detail, it gives a slightly alternative way of looking at the path. So, um, uh, so here you start off with generosity, which is interesting, right? So before you come to virtue, you come to generosity. So generosity is considered to be more basic than the full virtue. So for that reason, you, you know, this is kind of where uh, so you begin with that if you can, uh, and then comes the virtue, because the virtue is very involved in Buddhism. Uh, the sila, as I mentioned many times, uh, and so it's quite hard to fulfill all the silas. Uh, so uh, generosity, virtue, and as you move kind of along the scale, uh, you don't lose the previous one, you bring the generosity with you on into the next stage. It's not as if you become generous and then next time you're virtuous you kind of give up on generosity. That would be very counterproductive. You bring it with you uh, and you actually purify it further so it becomes part of virtue if you like. Yeah. And then comes the idea of uh, heaven, yeah, because heaven uh, is really about the results of virtue and generosity. Yeah. So if you, uh, so then comes the idea of uh, uh, heavenly realms being, uh, you know, you get reborn there, but then you want to overcome those heavenly realms. That is the drawbacks of sensuality, which is part of that. Uh, you understand the sensory realm uh, as inherently problematic. Uh, and I've been talking a little bit about this on this retreat, uh, and it can be quite challenging for people. Uh, I recognize that, uh, especially when you are beginners uh, on Buddhism, uh, because it sounds like some kind of world-denying religion. Uh, and it is, Buddhism is a little bit world-denying, I have to admit. Uh, so it's not entirely, you would be entirely wrong if that's what you think. Yeah. Uh, but of course the point of it is not to kind of destroy or kind of not having any fun in the world or having any pleasures. The purpose is to achieve something higher. So that's kind of the point, yeah. So you get into the samadhi instead. Uh, as long as you don't get into the samadhi and you don't have that happiness of meditation, uh, Please continue to enjoy the more sensory world. There's nothing wrong with enjoying it, provided uh, you do it in a moral way. If you do it in a moral way, enjoy your way. There's nothing really fundamentally wrong with that. Uh, and then as you gradually start to see the drawbacks in that world, uh, and you get some of the benefits of kindness and generosity and these kind of things, uh, you start to get access to meditation, and then you kind of drop some of the attachment and craving for the world of the five senses. Uh, and that is really the critical thing. Uh, is that it is not so much that you don't enjoy that world anymore. Uh, you still enjoy it. Uh, even Arahants actually enjoy the world of the five senses in some way. Uh, but you, uh, you just eliminate the attachment and the craving for those things, uh, which then allows you to enter samadhi and stillness and these kind of things. Uh. It's one of those things that I found very interesting in the, uh, in the suttas, the way they describe the five senses. Uh, and the way that the noble ones relate to the five senses. 
Because what this what it says is that if you come out of a jhana experience, a deep samadhi experience, uh, you enjoy the senses more than you did before, uh, right? Uh, so when you eliminate the craving and the attachment, uh, and the only way you can enter a deep samadhi is precisely by eliminating craving and attachment, if you eliminate that, you actually enjoy it more. Uh, it's just that you have no craving and attachment anymore. Uh, and in fact, it is the very reason why you enjoy it more is precisely because you have no craving attachment. Uh, these are problematic if you want to enjoy something, because craving takes you into the future. Attachments give you this bias. But when your mind is really neutral and cool, uh, you can actually enjoy it or sense pleasure in a, in a higher way. Uh, so it's not about giving up the enjoyment of these things. Uh, that was the wrong way of thinking about uh, uh, this five sense realm. Uh, it's more about seeing it clearly, so you detach a little bit, you withdraw, uh, and when you withdraw your attachment, uh, that is where deep meditation becomes possible. Uh, because deep meditation is precisely the letting go of the world, of the five senses, uh, and you cannot attach and let go at the same time. So you have to let go of that uh, holding on to that world. Uh. So you are generous, you are virtuous, uh, then you're kind of uh, leaning towards heaven, but then when you're leaning towards heaven you realize actually that also is not satisfactory. So you see the drawbacks in sensuality and the rewards in renunciation. Yeah, this is kind of an important point, it's a rewarding to renounce. And by renouncing we mean giving up attachment and desire. Uh, and uh, <laughs> when you do that, then the five hindrances are gone, yeah, because the number one of the five hindrances is Kalma Chanda, which is desire for the five sense world, that is the prominent one. If you give up the first one of the five hindrances, the other, f the other four uh, also kind of disappear pretty much at the same time, because these are so closely linked to each other. Uh, Kama Chanda is kind of number one problem. Uh, that gives also rise to ill will, it gives rise to lots of restlessness, and it gives like, rise to tiredness and lethargy, because it drains the energy of the mind, uh, and doubt also, because as long as you have these defilements in the mind, that there is a degree of uncertainty as to what really is wholesome and unwholesome, what is skillful and unskillful. So all that is given up, and then the Buddha sees, okay, your mind is ready, yeah? he kind of sees this, like, I guess, yeah? and then he teaches the Four Noble Truths, which basically means understanding of Dukkha and Sukkha and the causes of these things, and then if you are ready, the light bulb goes on, yeah? And the light bulb goes on means you become a stream enter. You see, according to reality, yata, bhuta, nyana, dasana. So, uh, yes, it is a nice roadmap. It's a little bit too sketchy huh, to give you the full understanding of what you need to do. <coughs> and that's why I say the gradual training, as I found in Majjhima Malachi 27, is better, because it gives you a more complete understanding of what these things are. Huh? But yes, you are certainly on the right track. Ooh, okay, so let's see. <laughs> Dear Ajahn, we have been having some crazy experiences in my meditation. Please bear with me while I try to explain succinctly. Uh, regularly I feel waves of joy through my body and see flashes of fields of lights, but sometimes it turns dark and I feel extremely neutral and or peaceful. Yesterday I was basically bawling my eyes out because of the deep sense of beauty and serenity and relief. And I wouldn't consider myself to be a sentimental person. Later it turned darker, nothing was there instead of the breath. And a perception of my hands, which was completely distorted, like tree branches that had grown into each other. I recognize the descriptions of jhanas, but then I still register sounds, although the volume seems down and there is perception related to the body. Although distorted, what do you think this is and what should I do with much gratitude? This is really cool stuff, yeah, you're obviously doing well in your meditation, so that's kind of, that's marvelous. And uh, a bit of craziness is to be expected when your mind becomes peaceful because you're entering a different realm and reality things are going to be different. But when we say craziness, it doesn't mean you actually mentally you don't feel crazy. It's just that your perceptions are unusual. And the only time to be worried is if you feel confused or you feel angry or you feel like you're kind of losing uh, your sanity. That's when you have to be careful. 
But as long as the mind is clear, you are enjoying it, uh, even though your perceptions are weird, you don't have to worry about those perceptions. Uh, it's only if you feel that things are really going uh, funny, you're kind of going a bit mad, that's when you have to be careful. So the fact that the body feels like, you know, the, your hands feel in this way, like what you said, the intertwined branches of trees or something, uh, completely distorted. Uh, it is, this, these are the sort of things you can, exactly the kind of things you can expect uh, when the mind becomes peaceful. Uh. So uh, it seems, sounds to me like you are having a really good time uh, and there is a variety of different perceptions uh, and all you really have to do is to stabilize that meditation a little bit. Uh, yes, stay with the joy. If you have flashes of light, you want to wait till the, these are probably the beginning of the nimittas we're talking about. Uh, so stay a bit more with the joy, stay with the breath, and then those flashes will eventually become more stable. And then when they become stable, that's when they become powerful enough that you can kind of go with them and follow with them. And um, so feeling very peaceful when it turns dark, that is fine. Yeah, that's, that is no problem at all. Bawling your eyes out is also okay. <laughs> that's, I mean, it's nice to just be able to be natural, right? And not to have to pretend, that just allow the emotions and allow whatever to come out. And it's good. And sometimes it is this recognition that you have found something really powerful, something really beautiful. Of course that makes you cry sometimes, because it is just this feeling that, you know, what have I been... All this has always been available to me, and now i finally got it. And if it kind of... Of course it's going to overwhelm you to some extent. So uh, this is really, uh, really good stuff. So just carry on, stabilize it, stay with these experiences longer, uh, and uh, then uh, as you do that, you will go even deeper over time. Uh, yeah, you haven't reached the jhanas yet, but you are on the way, uh, yeah, doing very well. So excellent, carry on. All right, another little essay, so this is good. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, dear Ajahn, after reflecting on something Bhante said about the clear comprehension, I've got something to get clarified. Actually, this is on the way I've understood it, so please kindly correct if I've got this wrong. Bhante said something along the lines of that clear comprehension should be about something we are about to do, and it should be applied before the activity, suitability and purpose, or were the aspects to be considered. But I find it difficult to reconcile this with a clear comprehension section of the Satipatthana Sutta, when some activities in it are considered, for example, when um, savoring something, or walking and standing, and um, looming in looming straight, in, no, looking straight, looking away, etc., defecating, urinating, etc. It doesn't make good sense to uh, clearly comprehend before these are done. It seems, according to the Sutta, you have to be clearly comprehend while doing it. Uh, also, Bhante wouldn't be doing a clear comprehension before the activity means that it is not done in the uh, present moment or during the activity it is performed. Uh, Bhante, so let's start with that, and then we'll go to the last part uh, afterwards. So it's not just before, but it is also during the activity my point is more like this is not really about being mindful in every moment. It doesn't matter whether you are doing that activity in the appropriate way. That is what it is about. So that you don't give rise to defilements, you don't kind of build up anything negative. So it's more about understanding the activity in the right way, rather than just merely being mindful of the activity. You're right that it is in the Satipatthana Sutta, but it doesn't belong in the Satipatthana Sutta. And that, I think, to me, is the interesting part. It actually belongs before the Satipatthana Sutta. And uh, it's kind of strange, because if you look at the gradual training, you f tend to find uh, mindfulness and clear comprehension in two different places. Uh, first, before Satipatthana, as part of right effort, and then within Satipatthana. And it's exactly the same formula. And so you wonder, what is going on there? And I think what is going on is that, uh, again, and this comes out also through comparative studies of the Sutta, actually it belongs before Satipatthana and not inside Satipatthana practice. And then it makes sense that it is not about being aware moment to moment, but actually that it is about more the idea of 
sense restraint, where you use your wisdom to look at uh, uh, what is happening to you. Are you fulfilling the purpose of the path? Or are you not fulfilling the purpose of the path? Is what you're doing suitable or not? Uh, so there is a general sense of uh, reflecting on this as you do the activity, but it is not an, a, a mindful awareness moment to moment as it is often taken. It is a, there's a particular purpose to it. Uh, that is to ensure that whatever you do, it is leading onwards on the path uh, and not kind of detracting from the path. Yeah, so that is, uh, that is my argument there. And if you look at the uh, grammatical construction of the sutta, and then now it's getting very technical, but uh, the grammatical construction allows for different interpretations. Uh, we can mean you do this uh, while walking, or you can do uh, sampajanya, clear, full awareness, uh, about walking, about eating, about sleeping. And sleeping is the critical one. Because you cannot be mindful during sleep, it must mean that the construction here is about sleeping, concerning sleeping. You understand, in other words, the right amount and all these kind of things. Same with food, yeah? The right amount of eating, the right kind of food that is supportive. You understand that. You don't eat too much, you don't eat too little, these kind of things. It's not about merely being mindful of eating, because that's kind of empty. Yeah, okay, you're just mindful, but that mindfulness must come with some sort of instruction that actually makes it meaningful. Huh? And that has to do with the right quantity, the amount, and all of these kind of things. Huh? Um, Kumbhanta also confirmed that the four Sampajanyas, uh, uh, Sataka, Asamoha, Sampaya, and Gojara, are not from the Suttas. Yes, I can confirm that. It's all commentarial. Huh? And of these four, huh, it is... Uh, uh, Sataka and Sampaya, which are the most important ones, they're the first two ones, uh, and they have to do with purpose and suitability, whereas the two other ones are actually very a more profound aspect of Sampajanya. So I would say that Sataka and Sampaya belong to clear comprehension before you get to meditation practice. Uh, there is also a clear comprehension in meditation practice, but that formula that we're looking at now does not apply during meditation. Then it's just a general sampajanya, and that is where gochara applies, uh, because gochara means staying with the meditation object. Uh, that only applies in meditation, not before meditation. And asamoha, which is non-delusion, applies even more profoundly yeah, when, you, when we come to uh, the stages, come to insight and that sort of thing. Yeah. I feel interpreting the clear comprehension part of the sutta in a different way as clear comprehension in sleeping cannot be explained that leads to more problems. Yeah, okay, I, I don't think so, but anyway, what if we simply take that to mean clearly comprehending that uh, we are falling asleep? Yeah, there's another word in Pali for falling asleep. That's the problem. Nidang o kamati means to fall asleep. And sutta actually means sleeping. Yeah, that's the problem with this. Uh, so um, the time we gradually go from uh, awake state to a sleep state on the bed. Uh, I would much appreciate if you could kindly clarify. So that is my understanding. I think it makes very good sense, actually, that we should have a preliminary uh, idea yeah, before we meditate, that in daily life we are aware of how our activities affect us. To me, that makes a very good sense, especially as a monastic. As a monastic, you have to go into the town every day or to the village. You receive alms, and so you do that with the right purpose in mind. Is it suitable? Are you going to the houses where, you know, that is suitable? Are you going to go in to look at all the kind of beautiful things in the city? Or are you going in simply to receive alms? And to have clarity about this is actually very important. In eating again, quantity, right kind of food, what is suitable for you. Just being aware of what you are eating is not very useful. It is using that awareness to do the right thing which matters. Talking again, very important. Yeah? You know, talking for the right reasons. Not too much, not too little, at the right time, etc. Keeping silent, the same. All of these are part of this. So I think it actually makes really good sense and it fits with the four right efforts uh, yeah because this is part of the four right efforts uh, and it fits very well into that uh, um, context uh, in my view okay anyway so there you are
Um, okay, I'm trying to develop my spiritual qualities so that when suffering arises, I will be able to cope with it. Uh, this has helped me uh, worry less. Uh, I still wonder about how to deal with the financial responsibilities of lay life. How do I practically prepare for losing a job, getting sick, retirement, uh, whilst remaining in the present? Uh, okay, so uh, that is good that you are developing your spiritual qualities so that when suffering arises you are able to cope. And that is exactly one of the qualities or one of the benefits of developing your spiritual side. It makes you more resilient. And the reason it makes you more resilient is because you are getting more contentment and happiness from within and you don't rely so much on the external world for your sense of meaning, for your sense of happiness and all, all of these things. And when you don't rely so much on, uh, on the external world, it means you are more free of that external world. Uh, you have more ability to deal with the kind of the vicissitudes of life and the, the problems that arise. Uh, so that is uh, exactly one of the, those problems, uh, uh, solving, partly solving those problems. Of course, fully solving it means you have to go a long way on the spiritual path, but partly solving it uh, for sure as you go along in this way. Uh, financial responsibilities of lay life, uh, losing your job, getting sick, retirement, uh, how can we prepare for these things? Uh, and uh, yes, we, I, you're right, obviously, you have to prepare for these things to some extent. Uh, we can't, I was maybe being a bit flippant yesterday, we're saying that uh, when you lose your job, you just, uh, you know, it's, it's a good opportunity uh, uh, for kind of just having a good time or whatever. Uh, and um, uh, of course, I said that not because losing your job is good in its own right, it is difficult. Uh, and I understand that people can have a lot of suffering over such things, uh, and I should perhaps be a bit careful with how I phrase things sometimes. Uh, my point was just that, well, if you lose a job anyway, uh, what can you make out of it? Uh, can you do something, make something positive out of something that actually is very difficult? Uh, and uh, the turning things around a little bit, uh, you can think, okay, well, there are some opportunities. Yes, there are some difficulties with losing my job, uh, but maybe there are some benefits as well. Uh, and uh, it's that kind of change of perception uh, where we turn difficulties into opportunities. Uh, and this is similar to the ideas, all the problems in the world. Uh, we turn them into opportunities uh, for practicing the spiritual path. Uh, so that was my, I, I apologize if I was being a bit uh, uh, flippant with these things, because that's kind of, I don't maybe I've just been hanging out with Ajahn Brahm too much. He kind of, he jokes around a lot, and sometimes these things come out in my talks, even though maybe they shouldn't, but you know what it is like sometimes. Uh, so um, anyway, so I hope uh, that is okay, but uh, you are right that you have to deal with these things. So um, the point is here, really, I think, is that you sometimes you do think about these things, but you don't think about them all the time, right? And so you set aside at times when you reflect on these things and when you kind of plan for the future so that you are uh, uh, you know, prepared when these things happen. Uh, but the problem is that sometimes these things intrude in your meditation. Uh, Right? And it is, not, it is no longer a deliberate kind of thinking. It is more the mind just ruminating on these things. The mind can't let go. That is the problem. So it's more like, okay, now I'm going to think about this. And you deliberately plan. And then when time comes to meditation, then you let go. That is the idea. So instead of being the victim of the ruminating mind, you feel more in charge of the mind. And you plan these things at the right time. So that is kind of the idea. But if you are a person who worries a lot, then very likely the rumination will carry on. Uh, but if you then set aside time specifically to plan, then hopefully that will take away some of the worry combined with the spiritual practice. Uh, so this is um, uh, how you would do it. And, um, you know, sometimes it can be useful to think about the idea of dying. Yeah? But what, ha what would happen if you die tomorrow? Uh, then all of these financial worries and all of those things would kind of evaporate. They wouldn't exist anymore, right? So in the face of death, many of these things become kind of much less relevant. And so the death contemplation can help you to let go a little bit of these things and realize actually in the big picture of things, maybe these things are much less important than I think they are. 
And uh, so then you stop worrying so much because you realize that uh, when you are faced with death, actually all of these worries, they become completely irrelevant. Uh, be gentle with yourself. Uh, don't do th If you, these things seem too harsh for you and too kind of, uh, uh, you know, difficult, then, uh, then just go, go gently and slowly and see what happens. Uh, Okay. Dear Ajahn, are you able to recommend any books or talks that are a lot more accessible than the suttas to understand the Buddha's life, the context uh, and culture of the time, and his disciples, please? Uh, and ideally, references where we can learn about the bhikkhunis and laywomen around the Buddha, please. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, there is a book about the Buddha's life called, I think it's called The Life of the Buddha, and it was written by an English monk called Venerable Jnana Moli back in the 1960s, and it is still considered one of the great books about the Buddha's life. It is basically just extracts from the suttas. Yeah, so, but the extracts are taken in such a way that it kind of gives you the life of the Buddha through the eyes of the suttas. That's actually quite a nice way of doing it. And it is quite accessible because uh, it kind of pulls together all that material in one place. Uh, and then he adds also a little bit of commentary to make it clear what is going on. Uh, and so that is uh, it's maybe a place you can start. I wonder whether it may be available online for free. I'm not sure. It's getting quite old, that book, so you may be able to find it online. Uh, so, Venable uh, Nyana Moli, Bhikkhu, The Life of the Buddha. Um, context and culture of the time. Well, I mean, there are kind of uh, academic books, I suppose, uh, uh, that talk about this. I'm, I'm guessing this is not what you're looking for. Uh, uh, his disciples. Well, actually, yes, there's a very book, good book on his disciples. Uh, uh, what is that book called again? Uh, the, disciples. the Disciples of the Buddha. Okay. The Great Disciples. The great, that's right. The Great Disciples of the Buddha. That's right. Uh, and uh, so that is a really nice book, to, and that has uh, uh, some of his uh, both male and female disciples in there, and you can read about them uh, in quite a bit of detail, and that is taken from the suttas, but also from the commentaries and, and all kind of things. That was Jnana Ponika, is that right? Who wrote that one? I think so. When Jnana Ponika, he was a German monk, but this is a translation and edited it into nice English, uh, so we don't need to read German now. Um, so those are good places to, those two books right there, you have two very good uh, 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 resources for understanding the disciples and the Buddha. Culture and very other context, that is a little bit more difficult. I don't think there is any really accessible books for that, as far as I know. Maybe there is, maybe, maybe I just, uh, sometimes I just read suttas, I have no idea what's going on in the Buddhist world. Uh, so, um, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not sure about that one. But at least that's two books for you right there, which are very useful. Uh, you may also want to read the Terigata. The Terigata is the, uh, the verses of the elder nuns. Uh, yeah? And it is basically uh, kind of inspired utterances by the ancient Arahant Bhikkhunis at the time of the Buddha. And uh, there's a very beautiful uh, suttas in there. They're basically verses, they're basically poetry. Uh, but it's very uh, inspiring and very nice. So, uh, as for lay women around the Buddha, uh, that is, I think, the material on that is very, is very not very much material on that. Uh, there is a little bit occasionally in the suttas, and uh, uh, they talk about the main lay women disciples, for example, in some some suttas in the Anguttara Nikaya they are mentioned, uh, but there is not much material there. Is it? Is that also in the Great Disciples? I don't think so. Is it? Yeah. Really? Oh, okay. Okay, cool. So that's also in the Great Disciples. Okay, so even some of the lay women are in the Great Disciples. That's good. So that should be very, very good for you then. Okay, so uh, see what happens. Okay, so, okay. Uh, sometimes when I practice, I get physically, sexually aroused. This does not come with lustful thoughts. Uh, okay. Um, at home, not here, okay. When strong emotions of faith, love, devotion are arising, so is it something else? I don't think I should be ashamed of this, but I am puzzled by it. 
am I a bit weird and dodgy? <laughs> in lay life, how does one engage with sexuality without being consumed by it? It feels like something I must explore, yet I'm reticent and afraid, perhaps. Sorry, I know this is two questions. Uh, um, don't know what this this is. I, I guess you're just going to have to investigate it, uh, yeah, what, what it means. Uh, if it, there's no lustful thoughts, I'm not sure what is happening happening with you. Just to keep on investigating, look into it, uh, and you probably will find uh, what the uh, root cause of this is. Uh, I'm probably not at all weird and dodgy, probably perfectly normal, that's what I reckon. Uh, sounds like some kind of very normal thing going on. Uh, just have to understand it a bit better. Uh. Engaging with sexuality in lay life, don't worry about it. Just it's part of lay existence. Uh, it is not something to... Uh, it, it is not as if you cannot enjoy sexuality as a lay person. Uh, it is just enjoy it responsibly. That's really what it comes down to. Uh, do it in a good way. Uh, but it is not something that you have to give up. Uh, Sometimes people think that you have to give these things up as a lay person, uh, but that is not uh, the case at all, uh, yeah? because that's why we talk about sexual ethics. Uh, otherwise, there would be no room for sexual ethics if you have to give it up all uh, completely, and there would just be renunciation, end of story here. So uh, the idea here, ideal, the ideal here is that you give up these things when it feels natural. Uh, yeah, you go with the path, and when you feel that these things become a hindrance uh, and they become a problem, that's when you give them up. Uh, when you see that there will be an advantage in giving it up, uh, then, it, then it comes naturally. Uh, and there are many lay people who live in completely sexual abstinent lives. Uh, yeah, it is not that uncommon, and uh, those who do it very often do it precisely because the meditation is going well, and they actually prefer to live like that. Uh, but don't force it. Uh, don't try to kind of live beyond what is natural, reasonably natural for you, otherwise you're going to just have more suffering. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with enjoying the sensual pleasures of the world. Do it responsibly, do it with kindness, do it with care. Yeah. See where the path leads you, and eventually you may uh, give these things up uh, down the track yeah, when the time is right. Yeah. All right. Dear Ajahn, what are the similarities between Dhamma and Advaita Vedanta? Did both teachings come at a similar time? Thank you. I think Advaita Vedanta may be slightly later as a full philosophical system, but the, certainly the roots of Advaita Vedanta go back a long time. And it seemed that some of the Brahmanical teachers at the time of the Buddha, they taught similar kind of things. Uh, if you look at things like the uh, Brahmajala Sutta, Brahma's Net, the first sutta of the Long Discourses of the Buddha, it talks about things that seem to be very similar to Advaita Vedanta. Yeah, the self being like a pillar, the self and the world being the same thing. Yeah? And the self and the world being the same thing is basically this idea of the Atman, who you are, and the Brahma, the world, being one thing. Yeah? And then when you die, this kind of unity becomes obvious in a sense. Uh, and they stand firm like a pillar. In other words, they, uh, they are uh, unmovable. Yeah? They are, these are kind of eternal principles of the world, and they stand like that forever and ever. Yeah? So the ideas are very similar. Yeah? And um, from a Buddhist point of view, yeah, we would call these things in Advaita Vedanta, usually we would call them samadhi. Yeah? Yeah, because they are satchit ananda is one of the expressions you find used. Uh, and satchit ananda means the existing mind bliss. Uh, and existing mind bliss, well, that's exactly what samadhi is uh, in Buddhism. Uh. So we would say that this is a state of samadhi. This is the Buddhist kind of point of view on this. Uh, and in Buddhism, you have to go beyond samadhi to insight and give up uh, your attachment even to those states. Uh. So that is the... Uh, so the similarity is that both concern samadhi, but uh, from a Buddhist point of view, the Dhamma goes beyond that. Uh, that is the difference. Uh, all right. Advaita means non-duality, by the way, and that is what we find in the suttas, ekata, oneness of mind. Divante, when the Dhamma perishes and the teachings are no longer here, how can a Buddha reappear and discover the ancient city and the path? Thank you for keeping the wheel of the Dhamma in motion, all right? So, well, the thing is that the Buddha, when the Buddha becomes enlightened, yeah, when he sees uh, what is going on, he realizes that other people would have seen the same thing in the past. 
Yeah, this is what he realized because he realized he has seen something here that is always available, and he would then understand that other people would also have had this insight in the past. These are then, of course, the ancient Buddhas, right? Because these are natural principles, and because they're natural principles, occasionally there will be someone who has the right qualities that enables them to discover these natural principles. And because of that, Buddhas would have existed in the past, just as Arahants exist as a consequence of the teaching of these Buddhas. So this is why he knows that there is this ancient path. He discovers this path, he travels it, he comes to the conclusion, and when he comes to the conclusion at that point, he realizes, actually, this path I have just trodden is an ancient path. It has always been there. It is a natural principle. It is always available. Dependent origination always applies in the world. This is a natural phenomenon. It does not depend on a discovery. It is always available in the world. Just a matter of turning your mind in the right direction, you will see it. So these are almost like natural laws in a sense, but natural laws of the mind instead of natural laws of physics or chemistry here. Okay, dear Ajahn, thank you so much for all your teaching. Our meditation has got even stronger experiencing pure bliss and energy here. I know it has not been uh, raining much in here, but it has been pouring down on my mountain top. Okay, well, that's, that's really good news. Uh, and you even made a nice drawing with the mountain top pouring down. That was really pouring down. Wow. And there's a bodhi leaf kind of fluttering in the air. Okay, that's wonderful. <laughs> much merit to you for, for the Dhammadana is supreme. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, what a wonderful little note. Uh, so great. Uh, Wonderful to hear people having so much fun in the meditations. That's really, really marvelous. So. Dear Ajahn, how do you let go of your parents, especially if the attachment is stronger? When the time arrives to say goodbye, then how do you deal with the, uh, or handle the situation? Uh, that's question number one. Okay, let's start with question number one. Um, so there the way to, there's a number of ways of dealing with this, and not one way of dealing with letting go of your parents is again to find that resilience to the Dhamma practice. And one of the things that Dhamma practice does to you because it allows you to access an alternative kind of happiness and meaning, it means that the world outside five senses, which includes your parents, is easier to deal with that world when it goes wrong. Yeah, actually, it hasn't gone wrong, but when it kind of disappoints you or whatever. So this is the first way to deal with this. The second way is to think about your parents in a new way. Yeah, and to think about them in the sense that when your parents pass away, well, what happens if you, have, if you are attached to your parents? Presumably they are good parents, otherwise you wouldn't be attached to them. So presumably they are good parents, and because they are good parents you can feel kind of happy for them. Yeah? They have lived a good life, uh, now they have passed away, and because they have passed away, they are very likely to go to a good destination. Uh, yeah, so you can imagine your parents, they've gone to a good destination, uh, and now they're kind of looking down at you, uh, yeah, and they're saying, daughter, son, uh, yeah, carry on, yeah, don't worry about us, we're fine. Why worry about us? Yeah, carry on, and maybe we'll meet again at some point in the future, uh, because we tend to meet with those people we are attached to. Uh, when is your turn to die? Oh, maybe you go off and you see them again. You know, many of these near-death experiences people have, this is what happens, right? They have, they leave their body, and who do they meet? They meet some of their past relatives, yeah, their parents, their whoever it might be, and they kind of say hello, and then they have to go back again to the human body. And then, and then they are so relieved, and they never really grieve in the same way anymore about the relatives of people passing away because they have seen this broader reality. So think about it like that. Think about, well done parents for having lived a good life. I'm so happy for you. Now enjoy your future destination, which is your rightful inheritance because of your uh, good actions, because of living so well. I'm really happy for you. Number two, remember you may very well meet them again in the future. Uh, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Yes, of a short holiday apart, maybe not a bad idea. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> that's a nice way of thinking about it, isn't it? Uh, and then also think about them, kind of wherever they are. Think about them. 
encouraging you to live your life. Don't worry about us, right? Get on with your life. Do what you have to do. Uh, don't we are fine? And uh, then kind of move on like that. So change your perception of these things. Uh, the problem is that in our culture, our perceptions are so different uh, from what we expect in the, uh, what we see in the Buddhist culture. Uh, cultural viewpoint. Uh, so just by changing those perceptions a little bit, you can actually make that uh, kind of uh, um, transition uh, and you can feel less concerned about it. Uh. So try something like that uh, and then see what happens. Uh. Question number two. I have a serious mice issue in the house and they are breeding. I feel so bad to catch them on glue pads and uh, versus as versus cruel death. Uh, what do I do without causing them suffering? Well, in the monastery at Bodhinyana Monastery in Perth, we have a similar problem. Rats and mice everywhere. And we have some of these humane traps. Uh, they just go inside uh, and then they can't get out again. Uh, and then we free them somewhere else. Uh, I'm sure those are available. Uh, glue pads doesn't sound all that nice. So uh, see if we can find some of those humane. Humane is the wrong word, isn't it? Uh, for mice. Mice sane? Mice sane? No, it doesn't work. <laughs> doesn't have work. But anyway, you, you know what I mean. And uh, so you catch them and then you release them somewhere yeah, in a nice forest or, or whatever. And then they hopefully they will be okay. Check it out. I'm sure you can find those on the internet if you can't find them anywhere else. All right. Uh, when a person who has entered the jhanas in this very life, uh, um, but in this very life, but one, is that what it's saying? I think that's what it's saying, okay. And a person trying to enter the jhanas in this life for the first time are considered. Uh, if Anapanasati is used by both for getting into the jhanas, uh, one, would the former always go through the first stages of Anapanasati before the Nimittas arise? Um, if you have entered the jhanas in this very life, uh, and a person trying to... Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what it says there. Anyway, uh, so it, it depends. I mean, it is possible to become very skilled at entering the jhanas. Yeah, the suttas say that... Uh, the ideal meditator enters jhanas without difficulty and trouble there. This is the ideal there. And to do that, you have to understand the process really, really well. Having entered jhana once is not enough, but many, many times you can become very proficient at them. And when you become very proficient and you are having been living a very, very pure life, and sometimes you can just sit down and the nimittas will just arise and you kind of go straight into the jhanas. That's possible. Uh, but even for a person like that, there may be times when the mind is not in the right state, and they may have to go through the more full process of Anapanasati to enter. Uh, so this will vary enormously. Uh, yeah, and it depends on your purity, on how proficient you are in jhanas, and of course if you are a stream enter or an Aryan, even more easy to enter the jhanas. Uh, you don't really have any obstacles anymore because you understand dukkha and sukha, and so you go straight for the sukha, and you eliminate the dukkha, and you go, you enter these jhana states. Um, would the latter always have to go through all the first eight stages of Anapanasati before the nimittas arise? In other words, is it possible for someone to uh, get to the nimittas uh, after, say, the first stage of Anapanasati, uh, in the first step of the first tetrad? Um, you, you don't really usually go to the nimitta straight from the first stage. I, I would say it's more likely that you go straight straight to the second stage, for example. Uh, so you go straight to the piti because you already have piti in daily life. Yeah, if you are very pure, you can experience piti. Just, just the idea of sitting down to meditate make you rise to piti if you are a skilled jhana meditator. So the moment you close your eyes, the piti is already there, and then the nimitta may arise. Uh, but you don't skip, you don't go from just watching the in-breath straight to the nimitta, because you have to have the joy and the happiness, first of all. So if you start with the first stage, you will go through all of them, all back in quick succession. But sometimes you may skip the first ones, let's say go straight to stage 5, or 
the fifth factor, yeah, and then you go from there. So, uh, yeah, I hope that makes sense. So, uh, all right. Dear Ajahn, uh, in the suttas there are beings in the luminous form and beings in the formless realms. Are these beings also experiencing dukkha? Um, not really. Uh, at one point they will have to change form. Uh, could these beings be the guardian angels or beings that help when we need help? Thank you again for the wonderful teachings and group interviews. So, uh, are these beings experiencing dukkha? They're not experiencing dukkha while they are in the states. For example, the states, we're talking here about the jhana states. If you talk about beings of luminous form, it usually means the jhana states. And while you're in the jhana, there is no dukkha. These are purely blissful states. But there are degrees of bliss, and some bliss are greater than others. So the lower jhanas, after a while, will become uninteresting to you, even though they don't have any dukkha in them. They still become uninteresting because you are looking for something even higher. Um, so, uh, but yes, at some point you will have dukkha even then, because when you come out of those states, then of course you will have uh, dukkha. Yeah, then it will re-arise, especially because you have lost something very beautiful uh, that will give rise to a sense of grief, maybe, or sadness that is all gone there. Um, could these beings be the guardian angels? Probably not, because these beings are beings in the jhana realms, and it's just too profound. They don't really have the ability to guard you properly, right? So, um, uh, guardian angels are much more likely to be devas in the lower realms, like the uh, maha, the or Mah I forgot that was Chattu Maharajika Deva, that's what it is. Uh, the four, the, the uh, realm of the four great kings that we talked about previously before. Uh, and uh, so these are the lower devas. So maybe the, even the late devas of the Tabatings I have in 33, they are quite close to human beings, uh, but they're still more powerful than us. And sometimes it is said that they can interfere in human things, right? Uh, they might be your guardian angel coming behind you, uh, always looking out for you. Not always. Sometimes they forget because they are hum like humans, right? And they're kind of a bit fickle. They're not always there looking after you. Huh? They're a bit unreliable still some of these days, I say. Don't, don't kind of put your trust in them because then you might have uh, gone too far. Uh, but yes, sometimes they do look after human beings. That's kind of nice, isn't it? To think of this idea that the devas may look after you. The more virtuous you are, the more likely the devas will look after you. If you have a very pure heart, you have a lot of loving kindness, uh, that is really the critical factor, they will almost definitely look after you. Uh, there is a sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya, the numerical discourse, uh, called the benefits of metta. And in that sutta, it says that if you practice metta fully uh, and you develop it completely, uh, then one of the benefits of the metta is that the devas will look after you. Specifically said in the suttas. Uh, so it's not some sort of uh, fanciful idea at all from a Buddhist point of view. Uh, and yes, uh, it may very well be equivalent to what we call guardian angels uh, in uh, kind of more the Western or Christian tradition. Uh, and this is kind of fascinating. When you look at the various religions and spiritual traditions around the world, uh, you find a lot of similarities. There are many things that kind of go across all of these teachings. Uh, and I think that shows us that uh, many of the basic spiritual ideas, uh, these come from real experiences of human beings. Uh, everyone is tapping into reality in a certain way and seeing reality from a certain point of view. Uh, and that's why when you look at the Christian mystics or the Islamic mystics or whoever they are, they, have, they talk about experiences that sound like jhanas and samadhi. Yeah? These are common uh, uh, common experiences within humanity, regardless of culture and religion and all of these kind of things. Uh, and that's interesting, yeah. And the same thing with the idea of gods, right? Uh, the idea of many gods, like the ancient Greek gods, or the Roman gods, or the Nordic gods, uh, and then you have the Indian gods, you have the gods in the Chinese tradition. Uh, and this idea of gods also seems to permeate all cultures. Uh, and uh, so, I, you know, I think that this idea of many gods, uh, I think, is a very likely reality too. Uh, 
I don't really have much doubt that these gods exist. Uh, so uh, all of these things are there, available for us to uh, to see, tapping into the same reality. So guardian angels is a nice concept. Uh, dragons is another nice concept. Uh, dragons, uh, almost all human tradition have some idea of dragons. Uh, so these are the Nagas in Buddhism. Uh, so again, uh, probably tapping into some underlying reality here. Dear Ajahn, thank you for the inspirational talk. Sir. Question about monastic life. Uh, why is there... Why is there a stratification according to sex? Does sexual orientation or gender identity matter? Thank you. Um, uh, does it matter uh, as far as enlightenment cons is concerned, as, uh, as far as uh, ability to practice a spiritual uh, path is concerned? It doesn't matter at all. Uh, it's kind of irrelevant. Uh, uh, we have all kinds of people who ordain. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's lots of... Uh, uh, gay people who are monastics, uh, I know peeps, in fact, uh, I guess it's the same proportion there as it is in society in general, so they will, you know, it kind of reflects society in general. Uh, um, so uh, there are people who want to ordain with all kinds of sexual and gender identities, uh, and we are trying to open up as much as we possibly can to allow people to ordain. Uh, but it is a little bit tricky because um, we, are, we are kind of, we have the monastic uh, code, yeah, which kind of regulates these things for us. So. And that monastic code was written two and a half thousand years ago, and sometimes it is a little bit hard to judge exactly what is meant by some of these regulations. So. And the conservative people, which uh, religion is famous for the conservative people, the same is true with Buddhism, yeah, it tends to be very conservative, uh, it tends to read these things in a conservative way, which can stop people from ordaining. Yeah. But I don't think that is the right way of reading these ancient texts. We should read them in a compassionate way uh, to allow greater uh, uh, access uh, to the monastic life for everyone. Uh, um, stratification according to gender, I, I think this is something that also we're trying to do away with as much as possible. Uh, we don't really want to have that in uh, monasticism. Uh, and uh, uh, is there ever going to be a complete abandoning of all stratification? Uh, Maybe not, but at least we can move in that direction gradually, more and more. Uh, and uh, I think that is a good thing. Yeah. I don't really think that we have to have stratification. Uh, and for example, at Bolinana Monastery, sometimes we have some, I have sometimes invited senior nuns to give talks to the monks. Uh, and uh, at the end of the talk, if the, the junior monks will often bow down to that senior nun, uh, yeah, because that is, seems right. If there's someone you respect and someone who is living well and doing the right things, uh, why not? Uh, but uh, you wouldn't find many monasteries in the world where that is done. I think uh, kind of Bodhinyana is one of the very few places. Uh, also, inviting a nun to give a talk already, this, we have a tradition for doing that. It's actually very nice. Uh, it gives an alternative perspective on the spiritual path. Uh, just recently, I had a laywoman give a kind of talk to the monks. Yeah? I invited her to give a talk, like a bit of a Q&A, uh, because she was just very inspiring. And I thought, wow, this laywoman, she is really extraordinary. This, see what she has to say about the spiritual life. And it turned out to be really interesting what she had to say. Yeah. So I think sometimes if we hold on too much to the kind of traditional hierarchy, sometimes we lose out uh, and we lose opportunities for hearing Dhamma from different perspectives uh, that actually may enrich our lives. Uh. So a bit of flexibility in this area I think is very useful. Uh. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, I don't really know what more to say about this. Uh, ideally, these things shouldn't really matter. Ideally, everyone should be able to just ordain. Uh, but the reality is sometimes it is a bit complex and complicated. Uh, although we, uh, we are trying to see what can be done. Uh, but uh, yeah, you also have to be careful. You don't get it. You, know, you, you can only do so much because uh, one of the problems is that you belong to a larger community here. Uh, yeah, and uh, it can cause a lot of problems if you do things that are really out of sync with everyone else. Uh, and so you have to be a little bit careful of what you do. Uh, and uh, we have already seen sometimes the consequences yeah, of uh, ordaining bikunis, for example. It can be quite uh, hard consequences, or I don't know if it's actually hard, but that in the end it's actually perfectly okay. I think it's not such a big problem. Uh, but uh, you, you still, you have to take that larger community at least a little bit into account. And, uh, otherwise, it can become unlivable in a certain way. 
Anyway, that's the best I can do for now, unfortunately. So, uh, oh yeah. Okay. Dear Ajahn, I went twice to Tibetan monasteries in France, uh, and they use a type of meditation where you wish to take other people's suffering to alleviate their pains. Uh, it is called Tonglenge. Is it a practice recommended in the suttas? It sounds a bit extreme to me, or maybe it is okay if you have reached a high degree in the path. Or am I too selfish? Please advise. Thank you for your wisdom and compassion. So, uh, yes, I have heard of this kind of practice, and uh, one of the things that I have heard is that uh, uh, if you take on too much suffering, uh, it uh, completely makes you completely paralyzed, uh, because basically it is too hard to take on too much suffering. Uh. So you have to be very careful with these kind of practices. Uh. And um, so they may work if you do it in the right way, but as with all practice, if you get it wrong, uh, then it paralyzes you, and you, be, you lose all energy, uh, and you end up just... Uh, lying in bed all day, not being able to move or anything like that. That's the kind of results I have heard from this kind of practice. Now there is an important distinction here between empathy and compassion. And uh, empathy can be, uh, uh, can be, uh, can really um, uh, make you kind of, just too much because you're taking on the suffering. Empathy means you're feeling the suffering of others, and yeah, that's empathy. Whereas compassion is helping to resolve the suffering of others. So this is quite different. If you just feel the suffering of others, if you just have empathy, if you have too much empathy in the world, taking on all of these feelings all the time, yeah, there's too much suffering. Yeah. It's too hard, yeah. especially with this kind of practice. Yeah. But if it is more on the compassionate side, yeah, then maybe you can deal with it in the right way. Yeah. So then it is more about, okay, these beings have suffering. How can I help them? How can I alleviate this? Yeah. Then it may work. Yeah. But it is uh, tricky here. Yeah. And I think this is one of the reasons why in the suttas, uh, when you see the four Brahma Viharas, or the four divine abidings, it's always metta is number one. Metta, loving kindness, then comes compassion, number two. Then comes mudita, kind of uh, altruistic joy. And then the last one is upeka, the equanimity of evenness of mind. But metta is always first. Uh, and I think the reason why metta is first is because metta means seeing the good qualities in others. Uh, it means being friendly with others. Uh, it means rejoicing and seeing the good parts. That is never negative. It is never painful. But when you go to compassion, it is more dangerous because the moment you go to compassion, you're focusing on suffering. And if you get it wrong, you end up being paralyzed, as some people do who practice this kind of practice. So, uh, yes, I think it is uh, it can be dangerous. And it is not in the suttas at all. It is not found in the sutta. This seems to be a particularly Tibetan kind of practice, uh, yeah, and uh, that is so, uh, um, again, it, this doesn't mean it is wrong, uh, but it means that maybe one should be a bit careful there. All right. Dear Ajahn, body parts contemplation comes before breath meditation, ideally to be done before breath meditation. When the breath meditation progresses, could we still do body contemplation kindly? Uh, uh, explain that. Um, then this now you are referring to the uh, Satipatthana Sutta, and in that Sutta it is true that it comes before breath contemplation, uh, but uh, if we say that the breath contemplation does not belong in Satipatthana Sutta, then they are more parallel than one coming before the other. Uh, I don't think that sequence is all that important uh, that you find there, because the sequence varies a lot depending on uh, where you get your uh, information, Satipatthana information from. So I don't think that sequence is uh, all that important. Uh, so what I, what is uh, uh, recommendable if you find that your breath meditation stagnates, uh, one of the reasons why it stagnates uh, is because of attachments to the body. Yeah, you're holding on to the body, you can't let go, so you can't move on to uh, the bliss or the happiness and the mind and all of these kind of things. Uh, and when you feel that you stagnate with your breath, then body contemplation can be useful. Then, but it helps you to let go. And that can be the 31 parts of the body. It can be a four-element contemplation. Yeah, these kind of things. And that may be helpful to give you a little bit more um, neutral view of the body, not so much attachment. 
But as I mentioned yesterday, you can also use things like the uh, uh, non uh, perception of non-delight in the whole world, the whole five sense world. Uh, so let go a little bit of the five sense world. Sambaloki anabhidatta sandhya. That can also be useful. Uh, and all of these things will have a similar kind of uh, effect uh, on the mind. Yeah, letting go, uh, allowing things to be here. Uh, and then that will deepen your meditation as a consequence. Uh, so these meditations can work together very beautifully in this way here. Okay, dear Ajahn, in moments of fear or distress, is there something uh, we should uh, recite? Uh, is the repeating uh, Bhagava Arahang Samma Sambuddha okay? Uh, absolutely okay. Uh, yeah, no problems at all. I think it may be a very good idea. Yeah, but really it depends whether it works or not. Uh, and if, if, if reciting uh, uh, the qualities of the Buddha works for you when you feel distressed and fearful, great, use it for that purpose. Uh, yeah, because it reminds you of the Dhamma a little bit. Uh, it puts your mind in the right direction. Uh, and especially if you are more maybe of a, someone who has grown up in a Buddhist country uh, and you have that more traditional Buddhist background, it means you have a relationship with these words. Yeah? I mean, for someone who's grown up in the West, it may not work in the same way because you haven't got the same relationship with these things. Uh, but if you have heard these things when you were a child, maybe your parents uh, chanted it or you went to the temple, you heard it all the time and you have really nice associations with these things, uh, then of course they can be very powerful there. Uh. Um, you can also chant paritas. Yeah? Paritas are supposed to be protecting. The word parita means protection. And so if you chant the parita, it can also be nice. If you know some of these uh, uh, ancient Pali chants, uh, you can do that. Uh, so you can recite anything. Uh, yeah? The Dajanga parita is a famous one. Uh, the qualities of the triple gem. Uh, that, of course, is precisely part of this one right here. Uh, and uh, so, uh, absolutely, uh, go for it. Uh, and... Uh, uh, so whatever whatever works, as they say, and if this works, it's, it's wonderful. Huh? Um, it is also useful, of course, to try to look into uh, the causes of the fear and distress. Uh, uh, because if you can find out the causes and you can deal with the causes, uh, you have more of a permanent kind of solution. Uh, yes, it's a nice band-aid to, to recite something in Pali, uh, but if you want something more permanent, uh, something more powerful, uh, then uh, try to understand why it occurs in the first place. Ooh, okay. <laughs> Dear Ajahn, many thanks for the guided meditation on death contemplation. I experienced the greatest samadhi afterwards. Sadhu, sadhu, uh, if you have time, I really appreciate your guidance on the contemplation on the body, please. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see what happens. Sir. We're getting close to the end now, but uh, let's just see what we can do. Uh, yesterday, after the death meditation, it crossed my mind that I have heard that one should not speak with the dead ones. How is that? Where does it come from? Uh, if I think people of people that have been important to me in my meditation, uh, I often fantasize. Uh, I often fantasize we are two birds flying over the valley below Jana Grove, <laughs> okay. Sometimes talking with them, sometimes just being with them. Uh, uh, I don't miss them, just appreciate them. Uh, uh, has it to do with the Peta Bhattu? So, um, this comes from the Visuddhimagga, I believe. I think in the Visuddhimagga it says that you uh, should not do metta towards people who have departed uh, and uh, exactly why it says that, I'm not sure. Maybe because uh, the idea of uh, it can give rise to grief, maybe, uh, and it can give rise to sadness, and so your mind is not pure enough to be able to give rise to metta. But I would say this probably varies a little bit from person to person. Not everyone will be grieving about the departed. Uh, so I am not sure if this necessarily is always true. And I think sending some metta to you and departed parents or family members or whatever, it can be a very nice thing to do. And they may even experience some of those kind wishes and intentions from you. So I would say, uh, experiment with this. The Buddha in the suttas, it never says that you should not um, uh, speak with the dead ones or send them metta or whatever. So um, I don't think there is a problem there. 
So uh, it sounds kind of nice what you talk about flying over the valley of Janavro. Please do that. Yeah, that sounds kind of nice. And you can speak to relatives and wish them well. May you be happy and well and all these kind of things. And I cannot see any any problems with that. Uh, Peta Vatu is all the stories of the Petas. I do not think it has to do with that. I think it's more likely to have to do with the Visuddhi Magga and the recommendations there not to use dead people as your meditation object. But I could be wrong about that uh, because I'm no expert on the Peta Vatu. So, uh, uh, yes. Okay, dear Arjan uh, and Venerable Chanda, or Venerable Chanda, when can we go together to visit the Buddha's holy places? Uh, it would be super inspiring to hear the suttas there. Please, let's organize it. Sadhu times ten. Wow, okay. <laughs> Not three, times ten, okay. <laughs> so I will leave that to Venerable Chanda to uh, look up. <laughs> 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 said I was overworked. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you can come. I will be going to India probably in December 2024. So uh, maybe you can somehow sneak your way <laughs> onto that one. Uh, keep your eyes open. I'm not sure when that will be uh, uh, be available. Uh, um, uh, it will probably be announced sometime on the BSWS website in Perth. Uh, so there will be something happening there. Uh, so, uh, but I don't think I very unlikely that I will be going on many more trips to India. To be honest with you, because I've done quite a few already. Uh, and there comes a point when you just have to say, uh, enough is enough. So come on this one. This may be the last one I, I go on. So see if you can sneak onto that one. Uh, that will be my recommendation. And maybe, I don't know if Ivan Bhashanda will be doing any more India programs. Not sure. It is really up to her. If she has the time, I suppose, not overwork other things. Uh, so you just have to see, have to see what happens, I suppose. Uh, so uh, anyway, there you are. Yes, I'm afraid that's the best I can do for now. Uh, Okay, dear Ajahn, what are the signs that one is on the path of stream entry as a Dhammanusari or Sadhanusari? Or is it possible to tell at all? And uh, I don't know if it is really possible to be sure. Uh, you will obviously have a very powerful faith and confidence in the Buddha's teachings, uh, yeah? and you will have a lot of insight as well. Uh, so there will be something in you that kind of uh, feels very right and very kind of on the right track. But whether it is possible to know for sure that you are any of these, I don't know. I doubt it. Uh, there is nothing in the suttas to say that you can know these things. Uh, the real critical change happens when you become a stream entry. Because when you become a stream entry, you are letting go of what is called the fetters. Uh, and the fetters are the things that tie you to samsaric existence. And the three fetters you give up when you become a stream entry are the adherence to um, precepts and vows. Uh, it is the Sakaya Ditti, which is the uh, the uh, theories of a self, yeah, or view of an existing entity. And then there's doubt, which is the third one. So then it becomes very clear because you're actually abandoning something in your mind once and for all. So it's a very powerful experience. Uh, Dhammanusara and Sadhanusara seems to be more of a kind of evolved thing, yeah, and for that reason, not so clear probably here. So I'm just, I'm just going to finish off on the two questions left then. So, uh, okay, dear Ajahn Ramali, I am uh, an associate member of the Buddhist Art of Western Australia. Yay! <laughs> That's what it says here. <laughs> and three. Could I take the five precepts with you at the end of the retreat so that I can become a full member of the BSW? Absolutely, I would love to give you the five precepts. That's absolutely wonderful. It would be my privilege to do so. If my other people would also like to take the five percent with you, perhaps a way could be found for those so inclined to do this collectively together at the close of the retreat. Thank you for your consideration. My answer is yes straight away. Anyone who is interested can take the five precepts uh, here after the retreat. Uh, you're very, very welcome to do so. It's a very good idea. Last question for today. Dear A.B. I think that's me. So... <laughs> <laughs> I think it is sad that you can't interact with the live audience during Dhamma talks and the Q and A. The answer uh, the is the in the way. The something is in the way. Okay. Um, 
Yes, I, at the end of the retreat, that we can have some interaction, right? And that would be really nice, and I'm very happy to have a chat with anyone who wants to have a chat with me. Well, if, if, so hopefully not too long with anyone, otherwise it can go, go on for a long time. But uh, I'm very happy to have a bit of interaction. So if you want to kind of talk about something particular, I'm very, very happy to do so. Uh, but uh, the only way to really have a kind of a reasonably silent retreat is to do it this way. Uh, otherwise it gets very interactive very quickly. Uh, and then uh, we lose some of that beautiful peace and silence that actually makes this retreat special. Uh, so that's the one reason why we do it this way. Uh, and I think overall, I think it's a good idea, to be honest. Uh, it is, of course, possible to have alternative kinds of retreats uh, where there is more interaction, uh, but that really has to then be decided before the retreat, so everyone knows what they are going to. Uh, and then when you know what you're going to, I think it is fair enough. Uh, but uh, this is meant to be a silent retreat, so I think it's good we keep it that way. Uh. Anyway, that is all for tonight. Uh, and so, again, please have a wonderful night's rest. Uh, and we'll see you back again tomorrow morning. And let's just pay respect to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha at the very end. Of it.